Good evening. I'm Leah Frieden, Assistant Manager of the Adult and Reference Services Department at the Fayetteville Public Library, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the library this evening, and welcome to those watching at home through live stream as well. Before you leave today, please take a moment to fill out the evaluations that we've left for you. Those help us to plan for future programs. This event is part of the True Lit Literary Festival. The festival is in collaboration with the Fayetteville Public Schools, Fayetteville Public Education Foundation, Altarusa International of Fayetteville, and the University of Arkansas Program in Creative Writing and Translation, who, along with Arkansas International, I'd like to thank for including this event as part of the festival. We have many more exciting festival events coming up this week. Tomorrow, author Susan Campbell Bartoletti will teach a workshop on writing children's nonfiction. On Friday, Danny Abernathy will teach a workshop on writing emotionally impactful fiction. And on Saturday, Kate Hart will tell us all about literary agents at 1130, followed by publisher and agent pitch sessions in the afternoon. We have flyers at the back for more information, or you're more than welcome to just flag me down and ask. Um, thanks again for being here. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Jeffrey Brock. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Um, and hello, everyone. Thanks, thanks for coming out to hear Kaming Cheng, this year's Arkansas International Distinguished Reader. Before we introduce our reader, um, I'd like to introduce the Arkansas International uh, and to offer some thank yous. My name is Jeff Brock, and I teach in the MFA program in Creative Writing and Translation here at the University of Arkansas. Uh, back in 2016, um, together with a, a stellar group of MFA students, I, I founded the Arkansas International, which is a, bi a biannual literary journal and a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. Who, and our mission is to put a diverse range of American writing in conversation with writing from around the world. The students who helped me found the magazine have all graduated by now. Several have gone on to excellent jobs in the publishing industry, but an equally stellar group has followed in their footsteps. Um, and I want to thank all of them for their hard work in putting the magazine together and uh, in, in putting on special events such as tonight's event. I'd like to single out uh, Lily Boudet, who is our outgoing publicity director, who unfortunately can't be here tonight. Elizabeth Muscari, our development director, and Sam Campbell, our managing editor. Our students are what makes our magazine so excellent. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, some individuals and groups who have supported us. Um, I'd like to start with by thanking the Whiting Foundation. Uh, last year they awarded us a coveted Whiting Literary Magazine Prize, uh, which provides three years of financial support and institutional mentorship. Just to brag a little, this is what the judges of that prize said about us. Distinguished by exceptional fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and comics uh, that are as attentive to place as they are to language, the Arkansas International lives up to its name, publishing fiercely observant and open-hearted work by writers from around the globe. When this literature converges and collides with emerging work from within the United States, the result is breathtaking. The ambition of this bright new star in the literary firmament is nothing less than to build a world community of writers and readers. We were so grateful for that statement and for their support and recognition. We're also grateful to a bunch of folks closer to home, the J. William Fulbright College of Arts and Sciences, the Department of English, the Walton Family Foundation, the James E. and Ellen Wadley Roper Professorship in Creative Writing, and most importantly, the MFA program itself in creative writing and translation, led by our director, Davis McCombs, and our assistant director, Jane Blunchy. Thanks to, to KUAF, our media sponsors for this event, and to the Fayetteville Public Library, especially Lee and Willow, uh, for making us part of the True Lit Festival again. It's great to be back in this wonderful place. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Caitlin Plant, who, our interviews editor, who will introduce tonight's reader, Kay Ming Cheng. Caitlin. Hi, everyone. 
Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, my name is Caitlin Plant, and I'm the interviews editor at the Arkansas International. I'm here to introduce our fall 2022 um, distinguished visiting writer, Kay Ming Chang. Kay Ming Chang is a Kundaman Fellow, a Lambda Literary Award finalist, and a National Book Foundation 5 Under 35 honoree. She is the author of the New York Times Book Review Editor's choice novel, Bestiary which was long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize and the Penn Faulkner Award. In 2021, her chapbook Bonehouse was published by Bull City Press. Her most recent book, Gods of Want, um, her most recent book is Gods of Want. Her next books are a novel titled Organ Meats and a novella titled Cecilia. She loves folklore, vampire literature, and bird watching in her home state of California. Kay Ming Chang writes unflinchingly about desire and bodies and family history and humans' connection to the animal world. Her prose is luminous and her stories sing with the ecstatic effects that come from leaning into strangeness. You never know what you might encounter in one of her stories. A girl with a tiger's tail, a young woman whose dead skin clutters the air like a constant mist. What you can be certain of is that her stories will take you to a place you had no idea you were going. But once you're there, you can't imagine being anywhere else. Please join me in welcoming Kay Min Chang. Hi, uh, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. <laughs> um, I'm so happy to see you all and thank you for being here. Um, and hopefully you can hear me as well if at any point, you know, if you need me to, need me to speak louder, let me know. Um, yeah, I'm so excited to be reading. Um, I'll be reading a little bit from my short story collection which just came out this year, Gods of Want, and also um, a few other stories that have been kind of inspired by my stay here, so, um, or that I've decided to read. Um, and yeah, I'll start with the first story. Um, it's a flash story, and kind of what inspired me um, is that during the pandemic, uh, I started learning um, Taiwanese, which my mom had never taught me growing up. Um, we always spoke Mandarin or English, um, and I had in my mind this grand vision of writing this really elaborate story about uh, martial law uh, in Taiwan um, when Taiwanese was banned as a language um, and war and linguistic imperialism and all these really big abstract concepts. Um, but the story really came together when my mom was telling me a story about a boy they used to bully in school. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe all of these huge historical concepts. I, it's all filtered really through this, through this story. Um, so it was a learning experience to write this story and um, I'm excited to read it to you all. Uh, so this is called Radish Head. My mother and her classmates called him Tsai To. He was the new boy in their class, the one born in a city, and he had a bald spot on the back of his head that was white as a shucked out eye. It was basically a birthmark, my mother explained, but not. Every time my mother told me the story, she reached out her hand and jerked out a few strands of my hair. Like that, she said, but much harder. Taito was one of seven children, same as my mother, but the difference was that he lived in a two-story house with a maid, plus his father was a professor of English. Say something in English, my mother said to him, but he never answered. He knocked his forehead with both fists and said, oops, I swallowed all of it. They called him Taito because of his head, but he ended up impressing everyone on sports day by running faster than all the other boys in the class. Later, they found out it was because a wasp had stung his penis and he was running to ventilate his crotch. But because of his record 100-meter dash, they stopped calling him Taito for an entire week. The name returned one day when they were standing in the fruit fields, shooting the watermelons with pistols. It was practice for someday shooting soldiers, my mother said. The watermelons are much more delicious to hit. While my mother and her classmates rubied their lips with watermelon rides, Rhines, Taito confronted them, twining himself with the vines. He, ar he argued that the nickname Taito was the Taiwanese word for radish, and since, since every Taiwanese word accrued a fine of one dollar, one girl got caught calling to her mother in Taiwanese and got fined so bad she had to sell her roof the week before a typhoon, it was illegal to call him Taito. Call me by my Mandarin name, he said, though no one remembered it. His real name was like something something son, my mother said. Some of the kids were scared off and no longer called him by any name, but my mother said she wasn't afraid of the fines, since the teachers knew she couldn't pay up. Instead, they kept a word debt, 
hitting her a total number of times at the end of every month, one stroke for every Taiwanese word they overheard. There was this one time, my mother said, when my first sister called out, hey, little sister, as I passed her in the hallway, and they took her out to the hills and beat her with some kind of branch. But every time they hit her, she swore in Taiwanese, which added another stroke to her debt. So by the time they finished with her, she had no bones left. She's still alive, though, my mother said. Right, I know that, I said to my mother. Aunt Iris came just yesterday to hang up this crucifix, the one with the missing ribs. Right, my mother said. Anyway, I wasn't afraid of the fines. It was Tai To who cried whenever I got fined. He used to stand outside the classroom while I got beat, and afterwards, when I came dog crawling out, he'd give me a pig's blood cake to reimburse the blood I'd paid from the vein, even though I couldn't really give him anything in return. And then he'd say he was sorry, like he was the one who loaded the words into my mouth and fired them. He was that kind of boy, blood soft, sorry. By the end of every month, the teachers calculated 200 words of debt, and I paid it all with my generous rear end. That's why I've got such, such a fat ass. I've layered it like a cake, she said. <laughs> now I'm impervious to blades. Any fist would get buried in all this frosting. Okay, I said. But what happened to Taito? Oh yeah, my mother said. He grew up and his father gambled away all his family's money and the house was damned to debt. Taito's mother said it was all our fault, that we rotted him like a fly-studded rind, that we corrupted his blood to mud. By the time we were in high school, he was as poor as us and he still looked like a radish with that bright spot beating like a moth at the back of his head. We used to flick at it with our forefinger, try to hit it with a pebble. I really wanted to press my pistol to it, not really to shoot him or anything, just to see if the mouth would fit, match the shape of it. I like to see a reason for something. Anyway, you're lucky, my mother said to me, because it's not illegal to say radish anymore. And now when I say it, Taito, I think of him in that watermelon field, his head lowered so far forward we could see that birthmark salting his scalp. And he asked for his real name back, which was something something meadow. He begged us not to call him that dirt word anymore, but the way it feels in my mouth now, Taito, without any debt tethered to it, saying it is sweet as watermelon meat. I wouldn't know, I said to my mother. You never taught me any Taiwanese. My mother smiled at me, spitting the shell of a watermelon seed between my feet, and said, that's good. It's better not to know how much you owe. Okay, and that's the end of that story. People always ask me, they're like, wow, the dialogue is wild. I'm like, listen, that's the verbatim. <laughs> that's the stuff I don't make up. It's always the wildest things that people are like, you definitely made that up. And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. I grew up with characters, um, and they, they, they do it all for me. Um, but yeah, uh, so then this next story, inspired by the fact that I've been told that the inn I'm staying at is haunted, which I was very excited about, um, because Ghost and I, we get along. Um, we have a rapport, um, and I, I love ghosts. And I recently formed a writing group, and uh, my friends and I were always really fascinated by that story of how you know Mary Shelley and Percy Shelley and Lord Byron were in a house, and they were stormed in, and, um, and someone was like, let's write a ghost story, and then Mary Shelley just like invented science fiction <laughs> as a genre, <laughs> and wrote Frankenstein. And so my friend groups, a friend or an, uh, writing group, um, we gathered together and we're like, we're on Zoom, we're not in a, in a mansion, but let's write a ghost story. So we all wrote 1,000 word ghost stories, um, which I highly recommend that as a prompt, just write a ghost story. Um, and this is what I wrote about. Um, and I did a lot of research into um, ghost marriage, which is basically when the son in a family dies, the family is so upset that the son can no longer um, carry on the patriline that they basically marry a human living woman to the dead son. Um, they marry her to a ghost and they have a full wedding as if he were alive. <laughs> um, they have an animal sometimes stand in for the husband and she basically uh, becomes the daughter-in-law of that family um, so that the son can continue uh, to pass on the family name. Uh, except he's he's dead <laughs> and a, a ghost. Um, so this is about that. Uh, ghost Bride. When my aunt Sanyi was 20, she married a rooster. It spurred her in the face on their wedding night, and that's why she has a scar below her left eye, pearled like a glob of spittle. In winter, the scar on Sanyi's cheek puckers out like a nipple. I suckled on her face when I was a baby, and sometimes I still taste the citrus of her scar. After I was weaned off nipples entirely, 
Sanyi explained why she married poultry. When she was 10, the neighbor's son was stabbed to death for his gambling debts, and years later he returned in his mother's dreams, quilled with knives like a puffer fish. He said he wanted to get married, or else the family line was forever severed, and he'd starve in the afterlife, etc., etc. And so Sanyi's mother betrothed her to his ghost. For the wedding, a white cock was used as a human groom. And when I first heard this, I assumed it was because cocks were the closest species to men. Because I didn't see a live man until the age of 12, I believe they all had waddles and wingspans, wide as the weather. I was disappointed to learn that men were neither vividly feathered nor vocal and that they couldn't be slaughtered for meat. <laughs> Sai always says she was lucky. A dead husband is easier than a live one. You don't have to cook or be clean, she said. You just have to scatter seed and give him hens to hump. Sanyi is the one who got me a job at the chicken processing plant, where we hang bald hens on hooks and sail them through a machine with a robotic arm that debones them in four seconds. When I first started working there, we got a manual about how the deboner is an intelligent machine that can discern, discern bone from flesh more quickly and accurately than an actual human arm, though sometimes, the manual warns, when the hen is abnormally shaped, the robot arm splinters the bones inside it and embeds the meat with calcium shrapnel that will cause customers to internally bleed and sue us for everything. Consequently, it is our job to massage the meat for bone shrapnel. And even though I wear gloves, my hands still smell of suppressed blood. I meet the girl one day outside the factory in the parking lot where I sit on the hood of my car with my hands open, hoping wind will smack the scent off them. She sucks her cigarette sore, and the way her elbow hinges at a perfect 90-degree angle reminds me of the robot arm, the two seconds it takes to yank the bone from a breast. Her name is Cindy, and she's wearing her hairnet even though we're outside, as if it's a uniform that might earn us a salute on the sidewalk or priority boarding. And that's the pride I love in her, that belief in our importance, even when a robot arm can command a blade better than any of my aunts, even though meat doesn't matter here unless it's boneless, shapeless, unwrapped from its spine. That night in my car, we jimmy our tongues inside each other's mouths, trying to pry tooth from gum, thigh from bone, thirst from throat. She shoulders me into the seat and I steer the bones of her, the mast of her back, her hip bones so wide they nudge night aside, her knuckles large and slick as the stone pits of fruit. When it's morning, we sit reclined in my car. I laugh at her hairnet, which now swings wet from the rearview mirror, the sun trapped and squirming inside it. Cindy's hands, lank as the dead hens we hook down a line, flop down in my lap. I tuck mine away, remembering the smell. Because I don't want to go back to the factory, I tell her the story about Sanyi and her marriage to the rooster. And Cindy tells me about her marriage to two men, the first who died on the factory floor, freak heart attack, and the second who she divorced, who was the width of asparagus. She says, with my man hands, I thought I'd snap the sprig of him. I tell her I love the landscape of her knuckles, mountainous when she makes a fist. We talk until another night knits over us, and she asks me what happened to the rooster in my story. I don't know, I tell her, and it's better not to have sympathy for the chickens. Imagine they're born bald and boneless, and we are merely returning them to the way they lived inside an egg swimming and soft, candled in our hands. Imagine we are preparing them for, for their next lives. Cindy repeats it after me, and the next time I see Sanyi, I trace her scar with my finger and ease oil over the hump of it, diluting the ache that still lives inside. It throbs beneath my thumb, softening its shell. The truth is, she reveals to me years later, the truth is, after the rooster spurred me in the face, I snapped its neck like instinct. I buried it that night, tore out its, best, its breast feathers, and scattered them in the yard so that in the morning it looked like a stray dog had snatched it. But then I kept thinking, how could I waste all that meat? I couldn't sleep. And though I knew it was someone's son, I unburied the rooster in the dark and started a fire and roasted it on a spit, my fingers lamping with grease. I ate the bones too, sucking out the marrow, gnawing soft the knuckles. There were feathers flossing my teeth, red and green, blood sunning on my tongue. Call it morning, call it hunger. What a day my mouth made. Next end. Okay. 
And then now I'll read um, just the first story in um, Gods of Want. Um, it is a flash story. I also realize now that I'm reading, I'm like, okay, the theme of tonight are like, is like mother, mother daughter, aunt <laughs> stories um, that are a bit absurd. Um, um, so this is the story, Aunt Land. Oops. I had an aunt who went to the dentist and asked to get her tongue pulled. We only do teeth, the dentist said, but did it anyway. She took her tongue home in a jar and flushed it down the toilet, and years later a fisherman in Half Moon Bay made the evening news, waving my aunt's tongue like a flag at the end of his pole. The police are still looking for the body it belonged to. I had an aunt who worked at the buffet and stole us a live crab, which my other aunt boiled alive. And when I tried to crack the legs with my teeth the way they did, one of my molars fractured into five and my other aunt, not that other aunt, but this other other aunt, spent the rest of the night tweezing tooth shrapnel out of my gums. I had an aunt who told me not to get braces because it would set off the metal detector at airports and trigger the German shepherds to run out and tackle me and the agents would confiscate my teeth and replace them with rubber bullets and interrogate my mouth with their tongues. I had an aunt who took me to Great America while my mother was at an immigration interview. This aunt refused to get on a roller coaster, even though that's what we paid for. When I told her to get on, she said, the only time I'll get off the ground is if I'm on an airplane or become an angel. And I told her she'd never become an angel because I saw her kiss a woman that time we were at Walmart buying four-ply toilet paper for my mother, who was in the throes of stress diarrhea, induced partially by her upcoming inter immigration interview and partially because I told her the officers would test if she was truly American by feeding her strawberry soft serve and timing her digestion. I said, that's why it's called passing a test, because they catch what passes out of your body. And if it's liquid, they don't let you into the country. <laughs> so my mother went out and bought two gallons of Breyer's vanilla to train her body to convert milk into bone and not brown silk. Anyway, my aunt locked me in the parked car, which I said was illegal in America. You can't even lock dogs in the car. And she walked up to the woman who had been following us while we shopped, a woman I'd recognized from the temple where we, where we prayed to save my grandfather's polygamous soul and kissed her kissed her so hard my own lips shriveled like salted slugs. I had an aunt who gave me the lingerie catalog because there were coupons printed in it, though none of us would ever wear underwear with jewels or lace because jewels and lace need to be worn on the outside so that everyone knows you can afford them. I cut the bottom halves off the women for no reason. At school, we watched a TV interview where a woman tells a news anchor how she stopped her attacker by peeing on him. I had an aunt who peed on me one time we shared a mattress. She'd been in the country five months, and when I woke up, she was trying to shroud the stain with a towel. She said she dreamed of being back on the island, peeing onto the roots of a camphor tree that didn't grow unless it was given water directly from a body. I imagined I was that tree. I grew because my aunts were watering me. I had an aunt who cut my hair for years until she got early onset something, some disease named after a man, and then she went around cutting people's earlobes on purpose, sneaking up behind them with their scissors and shearing off the tips like bits of shrubbery. And for years, every time I sensed something behind me, a pigeon or the gym teacher or rain, I assumed it was her. I covered my ears in my sleep, could never hear in my dreams. I had an aunt who swathed cellophane candy wrappers around the heads of flashlights and shined the beam onto my ceiling before I fell asleep, telling me it was the northern lights and when I asked her what even caused the northern lights, she said it was the sky having bad breath, the sky spinning its stars like teeth. When night is the color of all my aunts letting down their hair, I remember I have another aunt who got all her teeth bashed in on a bus. She doesn't remember the man who did it, just woke up at the end of the line with the bus driver slapping her awake, telling her she'd better learn some English, so she did. I had an aunt who said chewing orchid petals is the only sure form of birth control. I had another aunt who said dying is the only sure form of birth control. I had an aunt who wanted to name her daughter Dog because that's what Americans love most of all, dogs. And how many movies are there about American dogs that must find their way home to their families? And how many of those dogs die percentage-wise? And can't a name give her the odds she'll need? I had an aunt who saw me kiss a girl in the booth of a Burger King and said, I knew it. I knew you were supposed to be born a son. 
I had an aunt who pulled me out of my mother by a jellied ankle and said, of course she's born backward, everyone in this family is. I had an aunt whose baby died in its sleep so soundlessly she didn't believe in its death. She dressed it, rocked it, petted its head, not letting us take the baby away, until one night we tricked her, replacing the baby with a Costco frozen baked potato. She mothered the potato instead, wrapped it in a blanket, pretended it was safe in the custody of her touch. I had an aunt who died in a drunk driving accident, in a sober driving accident, in a suicide, in a typhoon, in the middle of the day while blow drying her hair, in the evening while opening a window, in the morning while hiking to the family grave, in an attempt to get away from her husband, in an attempt to get away from her father, in an attempt to leave the country, in an attempt to get into another one, in an attempt to outrun a river, in an, in an attempt to, out, to reincarnate as rain. I had an aunt who cracked an egg on my forehead when I made fun of her accent. I had an aunt who did my hair before school every morning, marinating my braid in egg yolk and butter, saying I'd smell like an American. I had an aunt who wiped her ass with her birth certificate, and another one who failed her immigration test because she named Colonel Sanders as a founding father. I had an aunt who made sausage out of wild squirrels she shot in her yard. And when I said those squirrels probably had diseases, she held me to the chair until I ate every link. I had an aunt who stood outside the bathroom and listened to me shit, saying she could divine the shape of my future based on how my shit fell, whether it sank right away, whether it floated like petals or sang in the water or became a fish. I had an aunt who never married and told me men are magpies. They want anything that shines. What shines? Blood, a bruise like an eye patch, a lake, Salt, a window, dew, sweat on a girl's collarbone, my aunt's pledging allegiance to the moon. I had an aunt who massaged my elbows when I cried and said, the heart is a hinge, to live it must bend. I had an aunt who said I should carry a rock in my palm until it's the same temperature as my body, and then I should talk to the rock as if she is inside it. She said we should all learn to listen through other skins. I had an aunt who said home is the temperature of an armpit. I had an aunt who never let me turn on the heat because if we don't pay for the sun's light or warmth, we shouldn't pay for heat or electricity. So she tucked my hands under her armpits and pretended she was a hen and I was the egg, swaddled in wings, swimming inside a shell of light, waiting to break, to birth, to sing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and this is the last one, I promise, and it's really, really short. It's only one paragraph long, and it came about because I'm always misreading headlines because I'm scrolling so fast on my phone that I'm like, ah. So I misread this headline once from, I think it was maybe Scientific American, and I thought it said, all whales exhibiting signs of lesbianism, and I was like, good for them. <laughs> but that was not the headline at all. Um, so for this entire, for a while, that headline was circulating in my mind. And I was like, okay, I have to write about this misread headline because it's just too, it's too good of a misreading. Um, so I thank my subconscious uh, brain for, for this. Um, this is called Extinction. The headlines that summer. All whales exhibiting signs of lesbianism. Scientists worldwide were distressed by the possible extinction of whales and tried all different ways to inseminate them. By injection of sperm, by in introducing mates into their territory, which frequently resulted in lethal fights. By releasing eggs into the ocean with a syringe the size of a submarine. By training members of the human species to learn whale song and impersonate suitors by introducing inflatable whale-sized dildos to entice them, by ladling whales out of the ocean and into tanks so that they could be more closely studied, by performing surgeries, unspooling their intestines like lengths of ribbon, securing brain and bone samples, asking animal psychologists to question why, why now? Are they suicidal? Do they no longer care about the continuation of their species? Have they inherited the human quality of selfishness? <laughs> Do they have a language for loneliness, singing and giving birth alone for so many millennia? Are they like the animals that return to die in the same place they give birth? What do they do with their umbilical cords? Do they knot the cords into nooses or bury them on the seafloor or eat them raw like eels? Do they surface to breathe or to watch us? Do they know the concept of drowning? Do they think the sea is as endless as we do, the depths we have never touched with our tongues? 
though we wonder about the dark. We wonder what it means to live inside it, in a place where light goes extinct. What do whales drink? Does thirst exist in their vocabulary? Does desire? And that's the end of that. Thank you. <laughs> So I think now it's Q&A, Q&A time, or I mean, I can always read more, whatever format, yeah. <laughs> Q&A, okay, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, oh, what the first literature I started writing. Um, I think I was a big diary writer um, and journal taker when I was a kid. I also wrote, um, I was very into People Magazine because my mom worked at a salon where we had just like constant People Magazine everywhere. And I kind of fancied myself to be a tabloid writer. So I'd write gossip articles about my third grade class um, in pencil and paper. And then what I would do is I, I slept in a bunk bed. So I would wedge the papers like in between the boards and the mattress. And I would keep them there because I was like, I don't want anyone to know who likes who, who's a crush on who. So I'm going to keep this a secret. But then I would secretly distribute it to my friends. Um, and eventually it got so bad that I did get called into the principal's office. <laughs> And I was told to stop writing tabloid <laughs> articles. Um, but I was so into like, oh, who wore it best? And like, who's getting, you know. Um, so I think I mimicked a lot of forms that were around me. But I feel like gossip um, and eavesdropping has, have always been part of my DNA as a writer. And whether that was writing in my journal or diary under the sheets, you know, making up lies about my family members and friends, <laughs> um, or writing gossip articles about my third grade class, distressing all my teachers, um, I, there's this sense of, I think, oral storytelling has always been the root of all of my writing. And I'm a big fan of People are always like, oh, show, don't tell. And I'm a huge fan of telling and the expository mode. And you can probably tell from most of my stories, they're just told. <laughs> There's the very few scenes that I write. It's all telling um, because that, to me, is, is the way that we tell stories to each other in our daily lives. So I always think, why can't you know, literature writing mimic, in some ways, oral storytelling or have that same sense of porousness or toldness um, to it? Yeah, so that's... Answer not very highbrow. <laughs> I wish I could say, uh, yeah, yes. What uh, made you choose Gods of One as the title for the collection of short stories? Um, also, what was the original title of that article for the whale? Oh, I think it was. Oh, it was something incredibly boring. <laughs> it was like all whales exhibiting signs of like needing to migrate or something like that, and I was like. Eh. Not as interesting as lesbian whales, but fine. Um, yeah, no, it's a really interesting question because I feel like co collections usually, the title of the collection is a title of a story from the collection, and there's no story in the book titled Gods of Want. Um, and it was actually a, a suggestion from my editor um, because there's a story in here, a flash story, um, where a raccoon is described as the god of want, and she highlighted it, and she was like, title question mark in the margins and I immediately leapt on it um, but then I felt it should be plural gods of want because I felt that every character in the story was some iteration of a god of want or a god of desire um, and I was really interested in the plurality of their divinity um, and how each character um, has their own cosmology um, and so I was like no not god god of want gods of want it felt more ambiguous to me and a lot more communal, because I think so much of the collection is about communities of people, which is something I think a story collection can do even better than a novel in a lot of ways, which is what I was really excited about, um, which was writing about the collective, like that first story, Aunt Land, about being a collective of aunts, a litany of aunts. Um, so it was, it was really exciting for my, my editor, who gets all the credit for it, Nicole Counts. Um, it was not me at all. Um, originally, the, the collection was titled Resident Aliens, which is the name of a story from the collection. But I just felt, because I thought, I was like, oh, Resident Alien sounds a bit sci-fi. I just wanted to write something like Aliens. Um, but it just didn't feel right for the collection as a whole. Yeah. Yes? Since you're um, a big fan of vampires, are you planning on writing any vampire stories, or have you? Oh, what a great question. <laughs> I'm so obsessed with vampires. Um, and what's really interesting is that I always felt for the longest time, I'm like, I have nothing new to say about vampires because everything that 
has been said about vampire, it's been done. Like every version, like vampire in high school, vampire in medieval times, gay vampires, like all of the vampires, it's, it's all been done. Um, but I have really recently been inspired by the new interview with the vampire TV show and various other um, vampire, you know, what we do in the shadows. Just, I feel like we're in a, we're in a vampire renaissance right now, which makes 14 year old Twy Hard me very excited, unbelievably excited. I'm like, yes, vampires are cool again. I was always there. I'm like, ha 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 ha. Um, so I'm very happy. Um, but I think with that resurgence, I figured, okay, well, I'm, I'll write towards that obsession and towards that interest. And if, if I find out I have nothing new to say about vampires, that's fine. You know, it'll be a fan fiction journey. That's fine. But recently, I have been writing about vampires, and I realize I do have something <laughs> that I want to say about them. Um, and I think. It's really tied to, because I feel like a lot of vampire literature is modeled around very Western questions. Um, and it, it's even in Anne Rice's work, like she, she'll say like, oh, this, this is a, a question of the West. And so to me, the vampire has always been a symbol of um, questioning Western religion and mortality and um, existential crisis um, in a way that's very tied to Christianity, which I love. I love. I love those questions. But I was like, oh, is there a way to ask questions about ancestry or ancestor worship, um, or to ask another question, which is the one that I wanted to examine is, what do you owe the people that came before you, um, and what does it mean to be born with a debt, to be born with this idea that you exist to pay back um, your parents or your ancestors and you will live with that debt forever. And whether that's a burden or a beautiful thing, um, I think was really interesting. So I was like, oh, okay, maybe vampires is a way to examine bloodline in a really fascinating way. So we'll see, stay tuned on that. <laughs> whether it ends up being an actual vampire book, we'll see. It could just be me writing my fan fiction. We'll see, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's such a good question. Um, speaking of vampires, um, I feel like Dracula gets overshadowed by Carmilla, which is um, Bram Stoker's kind of inspiration for Dracula, and it, it's uh, Dracula's predecessor, um, and it's about a vampire named Carmilla. It's a novella, so it's very short, and it's written by um, Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu, who's also an Irish writer, and I just feel like that book doesn't get its due, um, and I feel like it just it braids together so many threads of like queerness and um, sensuality and monstrousness in the body that I, I love so much. So I've been rereading that. Um, and in general, because I've been working on a novella the past year, I think really short books have been really interesting to me and works in translation especially, because um, I find that we publish a lot of novellas in translation, um, which is always really exciting. So um, a book called Sweet Days of Discipline, I really love by Flora Jaggi. Um, and uh, let me think. Oh, there's a book called Olivia by Dorothy Schreke, or Schreke. Um That's also a novella, and that's not in translation. It's written in English. But um, yeah, I think the, the short form um, right now is, is doing such exciting experimental things that I would love to um, carry with me. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, can you talk about your publication journey? Uh, especially yeah. you have a collection, you have a novel, you have a chapbook. So how do you? Like, how do you approach uh, and historically? So. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, yeah, my publication journey, um, it's been different, I think, for every genre, um, especially because I also thought I was just only going to write poetry for uh, a few years, um, and that tends to, the poetry world, I feel like, tends to have less gatekeeping in a certain way, um, and that usually, like, represent yourself. Um, and yeah, so for me, it was after I had a first draft of my novel, I kind of cold queried um, agents. And I was living in California at the time, so I didn't have very many like New York connections. And so I always tell people, like, you don't have to worry about that, because if it can happen to me, it can happen to, to all of you. Um, and I was very lucky that my agent, Julia Cardin, um, responded to my email um, you know, a short time later. Um, and then she kind of walked me through the process of working with a manuscript link project to edit it and to submit it to publishers. Um, and then for things like the chat book, that tends to be different. Um, so for that, there was no sense of like, oh, I need an agent to submit for me. Um, it was just me playing on my own and then submitting directly to the publisher, which I really enjoy that process as well. Um, yeah, so I would say for different genres, um, it's, it's, 
yeah, it's been every single time I'm like, I'm publishing my first book because <laughs> this is so different which, with every single genre. And there are just such different expectations and um, like ways that people market different projects as well. Um, but the collection was really interesting because I got to quite late editorial stages without even knowing what stories were even going to be in the book, um, which is so not like my novel, where by the time I was um, at the end of my edits, it was pretty much a finished, polished product. Um, so it was definitely more of a mad scramble, because I think with the collection, it was even more difficult for me to figure out what should be included and what could belong in another work. Um, yeah, so I had to... Yeah, it was like trying to um, wrangle like multiple unruly children. <laughs> Versus my novel was like raising one one being. Um, so yeah, it was a little messier, but still rewarding. Yeah. Oh yes. Have, have you really thought about writing a screenplay? Oh, that is a good question because I actually this past year um, have been collaborating on a screenplay with someone. Um, and it happened very, it was kind of like a beautiful coincidence. Um, like the person who was writing the screenplay said they saw my book in a Barnes and Noble and decided to pick it up and read it. And I was like, does that ever happen? <laughs> that is such a miracle. I was like, I don't even mind if you were just there to use the bathroom, it's fine. Like we've all been there. Um, but yeah, and um, he ended up reaching out to me and we we did start working, collaborating on something. Um, and I think I'm definitely very interested in that world, but what was really interesting in that process is that um, I never thought I was a very visual writer um, and everything also in screenwriting is externalized. Interiority, you can't just like write pages upon pages of interiority, which is where I feel like I sit in my comfort zone as a writer, is that space of internal monologue and interiority. Um, so it was definitely really challenging, but I find that going against the, my own instincts as a writer unlocked something in me. And I feel like that's also why I'm very genre restless, because I find that I want to write up against something or feel a sense of resistance or constraint. And that brings out these kind of new aspects of my writing that I didn't know were possible. Um, so now I'm kind of like, okay, what are all the terrible, th what are all the things I'm terrible at? And how can I try, attempt all of those things immediately? Um, so, and it's always been, it's been helpful and fruitful, even if it's a failure. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. And also feel free to let me know when I'm done. Like it's, <laughs> you can, yeah. Any more questions? Or? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.